Hi, my name is Corey, and I'm a scientist at Seattle Children's Hospital. Today we're going to learn about two techniques that we use in the lab called gel electrophoresis and DNA fingerprinting, and how they can help us investigate outbreaks. Over the last few days, you have been investigating an outbreak of an infectious disease on board a hospital ship. Hospital ships are relief ships that travel to sites of natural disasters to provide medical support. If there has been a large-scale incident and they need extra medical facilities, hospital ships could be anywhere in the world on short notice. In August of 2018, there was an outbreak of a foodborne disease on board a hospital ship where several dozen people became sick with a gastrointestinal infection. It was determined that the illness was caused by bacteria. Now investigators, including epidemiologists, are trying to figure out the source of the outbreak. Epidemiology is the science of investigating outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. Today, we will identify which food is the source of the infection using DNA samples. You have talked a little bit about gel electrophoresis and DNA fingerprinting in your last lesson, so let's review. The technique of gel electrophoresis separates pieces of DNA by size using electricity to pull fragments of DNA through a gel. The technique of DNA fingerprinting is a method we could use to determine if organisms are the same by looking at unique patterns in their DNA. Gel electrophoresis and DNA fingerprinting are typically performed when the illness is suspected to be caused by a bacterial pathogen. When a virus is suspected, such as SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, different laboratory techniques are needed. Let's make sure you understand a little bit about DNA. Here's an image of DNA. This shape is called a double helix. DNA contains the instructions to build and operate you. The sequence of letters found in DNA determines your genes. Your genes code for your eye color, hair color, information about your health, and many other characteristics that make you who you are. DNA is found in all living organisms, including bacteria, and we know that the outbreak on board the ship was caused by bacteria. Here's an example of what bacteria look like when they're grown in the laboratory. This is a petri dish, and inside there's food for bacteria, also called media. An epidemiologist collects swabs from the patient and the foods they think may have been contaminated with bacteria and spreads them onto petri dishes. All of these lines and dots are bacteria that have grown on the media. This allows us to collect enough bacterial DNA to perform DNA fingerprinting. In today's experiment, we will compare the DNA fingerprint of the bacteria from the first sick patient to the bacteria found on the foods the patient had been eating. From the case reports you have reviewed, you should have been able to identify the foods suspected of causing the outbreak. To review, they are strawberries, eggs, pre-cut melons, spinach salad, and burgers. These are the foods eaten by all the people who became sick. Without additional information, we don't know which food was the source of the outbreak. So it's important we perform an experiment like DNA fingerprinting to identify the source. A DNA fingerprint is defined as a unique pattern of fragments of DNA that we can see on a gel. Let's take a closer look. Here is an example of a gel. Each lane has one DNA fingerprint. The circle is highlighting a single DNA fingerprint. Each of the white lines or bands is a fragment of DNA. There are four fragments in this DNA fingerprint. One, two, three, four. Here's the key. If two organisms are the same, their DNA sequences and DNA fingerprints would be the same. If two organisms are different, their DNA sequences and DNA fingerprints would be different. Today we're going to see if any of the DNA fingerprints from bacterial samples collected from the suspected foods match the DNA fingerprint from the sick patient. That was an image of a gel, and here's the gel I will use today. It feels like a slab of jello, and at the top there are holes or wells where I will load the samples. While it looks and feels perfectly solid, when you magnify it, it looks like this. This is a magnified image of a gel, and you can see that it has pores. The DNA fragments will be separated by size as they move through the pores because the smaller pieces can do this more easily. Before I get started, I'll put on safety glasses to protect my eyes. 
Now let's go over some of the equipment I'll use in today's experiment. Here's a gel box that will hold the gel. Now I'm going to cover the gel with buffer. Buffer is a salt solution that conducts electricity during gel electrophoresis. I also have a power supply, which will provide the electricity. If you've learned about electricity, you probably know that there are positive and negative charges, like in batteries and magnets. DNA as a molecule is negatively charged. Therefore, the DNA fragments will be pulled towards the positive electrode. As you can see, the smaller fragments have an easier time moving through the pores. This will separate them by size with the smaller fragments moving further through the gel. I also have DNA samples. Typically DNA samples are clear, but I have added a dye to make it easier to see where I'm loading them into the gel. I have also added a chemical that makes the DNA fluoresce, or glow, under ultraviolet light. This will be important at the end of the experiment when we need to interpret the results. The other piece of equipment I have is a centrifuge. The reason we use this is because I might only have a small amount of sample to work with. Some of it may have splashed onto the sides of the tube, so it's important to collect the sample at the bottom of the tube. I will place my six samples in the centrifuge. Then I'll close the lid and turn it on. When they're done spinning, I'll carefully place them back in the test tube rack in the order that I'm going to load the gel. Oftentimes in science, we need to measure very small volumes. For this experiment, I will measure 20 microliters. To give you some perspective, that's smaller than a drop of water. In order to measure small amounts of liquid, I will use a micropipette. Scientists use this sophisticated tool to make accurate measurements over and over again. As you can see, the micropipette is set for 20 microliters. This means that every measurement will be exactly 20 microliters. The way I'll hold this is by placing this little hook over my index finger, and my thumb will go on this button called the plunger. Pushing down on the plunger creates a vacuum, so when I let go, it sucks the liquid up. However, I don't want to get liquid inside the micropipette, so I'll use a tip instead. Here's a box of micropipette tips. I will open the box, position the micropipette over a tip, tap down a couple times, and there we go. The first thing I'll do is press down on the plunger before I go into the liquid. Once the micropipette tip is in the liquid, I will slowly release the plunger. The sample will rise up into the micropipette tip. Now I can load this into one of the wells. The best way to do this is to place my elbows on the bench for support, and I'll use my other hand to help keep the micropipette steady. I will load the gel from left to right, starting with the patient sample in lane one. It's not a good idea to use this micropipette tip again. If I did that, I could accidentally mix one chemical into another, and that's called cross-contamination. To avoid this, I can remove the micropipette tip by pressing the eject button. Now I can get a new one for the next measurement. Then I will load the next sample in lane two, which is bacterial DNA from the strawberries. I will continue with the remaining samples. All right, now that I have all the samples loaded, I will connect the gel box to the power supply with this lid here. Next, I will set my power supply to 270 volts, press the start button, and let this run for 20 minutes. While the gel is running, let's talk about how the DNA samples were prepared. The investigators on board the hospital ship collected bacteria from the suspected foods in one of the sick patients. Bacteria are unicellular organisms. Each bacterial cell contains many other components besides DNA that would interfere with gel electrophoresis. Therefore, a DNA isolation procedure was performed to separate the DNA from the unwanted components. There are several ways that we could determine if the DNA isolated from the patient and the DNA isolated from one of the foods match. One way is to read the entire DNA sequence of the bacterial samples using a DNA sequencer and compare them. That's what they do at companies like Ancestry.com and 23andMe. But that takes a lot of work and time. If there is an outbreak going on, several weeks could go by before identifying the source and more people can become sick. We can match the samples more quickly and efficiently by using the technique mentioned, which is called DNA fingerprinting. During DNA fingerprinting, DNA is cut into fragments using something called an enzyme. An enzyme is a protein that acts upon other biological molecules. There are many different types of enzymes. For example, there are some in your stomach which help you break down food into smaller components so your body can absorb them. 
In today's case, enzymes were used to cut the DNA into fragments based on the sequence of letters in the DNA. These fragments make up the DNA fingerprint. That's how the samples were prepared. Let's take a look at a time lapse of the gel as it runs for the full 20 minutes. As you can see, the dye is moved out of the wells and separated into two colors. This is because the dye is a mixture of two different molecules. You can tell the purple bands have smaller molecules because they have traveled farther. If we see the dye moving, that's an indicator that the gel is running properly. Now that the gel is done running, let's talk about how you will interpret the results for your next lesson. DNA itself is clear, and we wouldn't actually be able to see it in the gel unless I did something to make it visible. That's why I added the chemical to make the DNA glow under ultraviolet light. I will turn off the power supply, disconnect the power supply from the gel box, remove the gel, and place it in this light box. It will illuminate the gel from underneath using ultraviolet light. There is a purple shield to protect our eyes from ultraviolet light and a camera up top to take a picture of the gel. We can use this image to interpret our results. Let's go over how to do that. Here's an image of a gel from a different experiment. Each lane contains one DNA fingerprint. The patient sample is in lane one on the left and there are five different samples in the other lanes. By comparing the DNA fingerprints or the patterns of fragments, you can see that the patient sample matches the sample in lane five. They have the same number of fragments in the same positions, so they are a match. This is the same process you will use to analyze the picture of the gel from today's experiment that your teacher will provide. Good luck identifying the source of the outbreak, and I hope you enjoyed this video.